Hello everyone, this is John, and I want to welcome you to another oil painting video. Now, this is still a really big painting for me, but it's not as big as a couple that I've done uh, recently. This is an 18 by 24 as opposed to the behemoths 24 by 36s I did. I'm still not even sure if I enjoy doing those really huge ones. They, uh, they definitely were quite a challenge. Makes your arm kind of weary at the end of it. But uh, it was a nice experience because I've never, ever gone that big before. 18 by 24s, I have done some. Um, not anywhere near as many as I um, do some of the smaller. 12 by 16 normally is my big size. And um, I started out with large when I was taking uh, classes in uh, college for art. And for whatever reason, I always... The smaller ones are just appeal to me more for some reason, and I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know if it's just a little more intimate or what the deal is, but I always love the um, smaller ones. So 12 by 16 is normally my big size, and 11 by 14, 9 by 12, stuff like that. But the art shows that I go to, there's a lot of people that like the larger sizes. So uh, I had a couple of 16 by 20s that people you know took up right away. So that's why I'm doing some bigger stuff to get a nice variety for my clients. Now, as you can tell, and I know you're shocked, this is a landscape with mountains and water. I know, I've never done water before, right? If you've followed any of my videos, you know I have water in virtually. Not everyone, but I don't know. There might be two, three paintings that I don't. And the water is... I don't know how to explain it, but the water is something that I've loved since I was a kid. And just to sound, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the ocean too, okay? But I'm a Midwestern kid. I think the ocean is beautiful. But there's something about a quiet stream or a nice Midwestern river that just kind of meanders around, whatever the case may be. And it's just so darn relaxing, and I can just sit there forever. You know, read a book with a glass of lemonade under a tree and just listen to it. So, for whatever reason, I've been drawn to water since I was a kid, and that's what I paint. I love painting water. And I paint it all different ways, too. Sometimes I'll do different colors, sometimes I'll do fast, small, whatever. But uh, I just have fun painting it. Mountains I like painting because they're just such a nice element in a landscape. They have, they can be very dominant and they can be very subtle, depending on, you know, what you're doing. And, by the way, um... You notice me picking up hairs off the uh, canvas support more so than normal. Oh, just an FYI. Change the subject real quick. You see I just flipped it? Don't be afraid to do that. That's not illegal. That's not against art law, and you're not going to go to art jail. Um, if you want to get, if you have a sketch and you want to follow the line reasonably well, go ahead and flip it. Put it on its side. Put it on its back. Do whatever you got to do to... Do your painting the way you want to do your painting. So anyways, going back to um, the water and stuff. So that's what I love to paint. There's something about the water that I just am drawn to, and I absolutely love it, and that's what I'm going to continue to paint. And I'll call me the painter of water. And like I said, I like painting it in different ways too, not just, you know, the same way. So it's the type of thing where water is whatever I want it to be at that particular time. Okay, this is Daniel Smith, Water Mixable Oil Paint. Now, you can notice in the sky, I'm having a little bit of trouble spreading it. You're going to notice that throughout this painting. I'm still new to the water mixable deal. Now, I did an 8x10 that I have a video on um, that's been out for a week, maybe two. I don't remember exactly. Where I used, well, I've been using the Daniel Smiths almost exclusively now. But I'm still learning. So, this painting, or it seems like the larger paintings, I need a lot more stuff on the brush, a lot more medium and or water to spread the paint. Where when I was doing the 8x10, I didn't use any medium pretty much. And the paint was, I guess, fluid enough. If It's not even a right word for it because it's oil paint because it still comes out like a paste. But it is loose enough to where... You don't need hardly any medium for the smaller paintings. Now, the support I'm using is the same as I've been using as far as the uh, the make, ampersand uh, Jessabort. 
um, whether it's an 8x10 or this monster of 18x24. Now, this also is a one and a half inch cradle, so this isn't uh, meant to be framed. This one is just, um, um, this is just um, meant to hang on the wall as is. So when this is all dried, I'm going to paint the edges, and then I'm going to put a real nice heavy-duty wire uh, on the back, and then uh, whoever takes this home with them is going to be able to just put it right on the wall. Now, if you look at the top of the painting, just above it to the left, you see that little half circle on the wall? That's actually a piece of art I just bought from a young lady at an art fair that was, got a mile and a half from our house. It was just a little makeshift um, art and craft show, and I'm, I wish I would have thought of it while I was doing the painting. It, it was kind of cool. She took an old 33 LP that I grew up with, you know, I'm 56, so I remember record players and the 33 albums, and uh, she painted acrylic on it, and hers was a little bit of uh, an abstract water scene, go figure, I was drawn to the water, and I just, I was walking by the uh, her booth with uh, my wife, and it just caught my eye and talked to her for a little bit and ended up buying it, but anyways, that's what that half circle is. Maybe the next one, if I remember, the next video, I'll kind of pan the camera up a little bit and um, show you the whole thing. It is kind of cool. It was a neat little idea she had. Okay, back to this painting. I've got four different colors in my sky. And I don't like painting just a blue sky with white clouds. I like mixing it up a little bit. So there's a lizard and crimson, there's cerulean blue, there's French ultramarine, there's white and there's ivory black. And that's what I do. <laughs> I just love making the sky and the water for that matter what I like it to be. When I first started art, I always wanted to make it what it, you know, make my painting look like the picture or make it look like where I'm painting or make it look like whatever. And I finally figured out, well I didn't figure it out. I had a couple of artists that have been doing it a long time tell me you don't do what it looks like in a picture or what it looks like in person. You paint it what it looks like in your head. And that's what I started doing over the last maybe year and a half, two years. It just, I'll take a scene and I'll sketch from a scene or I'll do it from my imagination, but sometimes I'll sketch from a scene. This one is actually a scene I sketched from. And I'll make the elements and the whole composition what I picture in my head not actually what it is. And that, I guess, is the essence of creativity. You know, you could take something and make it your own by just doing what your head tells you to do, what your heart tells you to do, and what your hand inevitably does on autopilot. Okay, now I'm doing a set of three mountains, okay? You see the one dead center, is real faint. Now that one is going to have zero highlights on it. The way it is now is done. There's nothing left to do to it. And the reason for that is because I want it to be in the back. Actually, I take that back. There's four. I forgot about this one here that I'm doing right now. This is just a little part of that other mountain range on the left-hand side. But it's closer forward, so I'm making it um, uh, darker so it'll so the perspective will be correct. Now, this, what I'm putting down now, is looking a lot like that. But as you notice now, when I'm getting towards the bottom and it's getting a little easier on the brush, it's green. Um, it's just a very dark green that I'm using right now to get the ground in. And then I'm going to use that same mixture, but I'm going to add a little bit of raw sienna to lighten it up and change it for the right. Because if you notice, the mountain range on the right is receding into the back to the right. And... That's how the land is going to end up, too. See, one of the things I found out, there's actually a lot of things I found out about painting. One is, as long as you keep doing it, you're going to get better. Two, there is really no wrong way. You do, you paint how you want to paint. Now, if you want to sell your work, and if you want to make videos, and you want to, you know, be known as, I don't want to say, a, I don't even know how to, what I'm trying to say. There are certain things in art that you do have to follow, okay? And they're not 
concrete laws like some artists will tell you, but they are things that you need to follow to get your art to a point where you're going to have people interested in it, whether it's to sell it or just to look at it, whatever the case may be. One of those is perspective, okay? And there's a lot of ways you can do perspective. Aerial perspective is what you see right now with those mountain ranges. Even without all the highlights, you can see for sure three distinct level of mountains, or I should say depth, distance-wise, okay? That's perspective. Another perspective is when I do the uh, when I do the highlights, okay? More highlight, more detail, richer color, the closer it gets to you in the foreground. So laws of perspective, you need to follow to a degree. Color theory, a little bit. And values, where it's the lightness and darkness of a color. And those are the basic things that you need to keep in mind in order to be successful as an artist, unless you want to paint for nobody but yourself where it doesn't matter. But if you're going to ever show it to anybody else, those things you need to keep in mind. Now, the way you do a mountain, the way you paint a tree, the way you paint your water is entirely up to you. If you've got the perspective right, if your value scale is believable, okay, if your color mixing isn't to where, you know, you got so many colors that they're just competing with each other, if it's just subtle, you're going to be a successful artist. But I found out from my own um, experience, those things are not all easy to do in the beginning. Now, once you've been painting for a long time, they're automatic. They're automatic. But in the beginning, you're thinking about everything you do. So this painting is no different. I was just on autopilot. I had the sketch. I didn't even look at the picture anymore, the photograph, because... Actually, that was a fall scene. This one's not. That one had deciduous trees. This one doesn't. And this one has some uh, foliage in the front um, right of this painting where the other one, the picture, doesn't. So I changed everything. I just kept the basic, let's say, schematic of it. Okay, now here's a trick I learned by accident that um, I think will help a lot of people. Instead of painting your ground or dirt or whatever, brown all the time, which I always did. And that also includes, you know, brown tree trunks and stuff. I still use Van Dyke Brown. I still will use it, or Burnt Umber. But this is a little bit of black, a little bit of sap green, and a decent amount of alizarin crimson. And you put as much alizarin as you want to get the look you want. And it has this, like, reddish brown look to it that is really cool. It makes it a little more makes the ground a little richer, a little more vibrant. I found it by accident, and I tried to repeat it, and thank God I was able to repeat it. And now that's kind of like my go-to uh, ground, and depending on the trees I do, that'll be my go-to tree if I do deciduous trees, which I don't do a lot of, but um, I'm probably going to start doing a little bit more of them. And, yep, you saw me just turn it upside down so I get a better angle at it and go from there. Okay, so this is basically the block in. Okay, and now I'm going to start just doing highlights and getting different details going. Now, one of the things that I learned is I absolutely do not like the way most of my mountain highlights come when I use a brush. I don't know if I don't have the knack or what the case may be, but I'm just not crazy about it. A palette knife, I'm finally starting to get real comfortable with it. And I absolutely love the way my highlights come out with the palette knife. And you can see my collection of knives right there. Doggone it, I thought I had that um, cropped out of the uh, video. Sorry about that, everybody. I will do better next time. Part of it is I saw there's a lot of my body in the way today. And uh, I couldn't really get it out with this size painting. So I had to sacrifice somewhere. Otherwise, you'd see more of me than the painting. And I've never been a GQ model, so I'm kind of doubting you'd want to see more of me and less of the painting. Now, here is something that I'm going to do a little different on this one that I'm working on than I did the other two. The other two are considerably darker, so they're in front of that one, even though that one's bigger. But what I'm going to do to kind of make it a little easier, and I tried with that little knife, and I'm just I'm going to end up going to a brush, and I'm going to put a little bit more 
blue for highlight, uh, for shadow rather, I'm sorry, where I'm not going to use shadow on the others because they're dark enough, they have their own shadow. So this one, I'm going to make a little more, I guess marbled might be a good way to work. Now you see how blue it is, and that's why I keep blending it in. And I keep hitting it to blend it in with that umber and crimson underneath it a little bit. And then that gave it a real nice look. And I didn't want to do it throughout all the different peaks. I just thought I'd be overdoing it. So I'm basically taking a couple places where I want, making it more pronounced, and then a couple others just kind of dabbing. And then that pretty much is it for that mountain. I think it may be, I don't know if I'm working on it a little bit more or not. Nope. Now, this is green and French ultramarine. Now, why would I put blue in distant trees and shrubs? Because blue is a color that recedes. It's a background color. Even though it got foreground blue with the um, water, it's still a great color to put stuff in the background a little bit. What I'm doing here is I'm taking a little bit of black and mixing it in, and then I'm bringing them up a little bit for little trees. I'm going to put some bigger ones in front of it afterwards, but that's kind of like the base, and that's what I'm doing here. And it's defining where one range starts and another stops. It's kind of giving it its own boundaries. And now I'm kind of lightening it up a little bit as it comes forward, and I'm just trying to kind of give it its own personality. That, my friends, is a 99 cent um, Ace Hardware 2 inch bristle brush that isn't good for a lot, but what I'm using it for, it's awesome. It's really a great little foliage brush, as you can tell, but uh, can't really do much else with it. Okay, now, one of the things you notice is I'm not just tapping and going, I'm kind of working it in with the tap. And that's because I want to blend it with the color underneath. And the reason I want to do that is I don't want it really bright. You know, if you look at nature, rarely is are the colors, you know, so bright where you need sunglasses and stuff. So one of the things I do is I'll mix on the palette and then I'll do what they call optical mixing, which is really mixing on your um, painting surface. Optical mix mixing is more for um, used in watercolors where you it's like glazing and you put, you know, Let's say you have a yellow base and you put blue over it or the other way around and then you get the green. I kind of use that term, whether it's correct or not, for when I'm blending on the canvas, or in this case, the wood itself. Now I'm putting in some nice trees just to kind of break things up. And now this puts all the mountain ranges in back, but it still doesn't change the order that they are. And you can still see that little one in the very middle it's real faint. You can see it a lot better in uh, person than you can here on the video, unfortunately. But that's pretty much the way it is. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is I want to put different little bushes and shrubs and stuff in here. And for this, I'm going to use like a real dark violet and black. And I'm just going to tap in the whole dark. And then what I'm going to do with that is once I have the dark down... Then I'll use the lighter highlight colors to actually make the flowers. The highlights are going to be the flowers themselves. And like anything else, when you're doing, you know, the dark and light, you got to save some of the darks. Because if you put all light in and kill all the darks, you're not going to have the right contrast. It's just not going to look good. It's not going to be good at all. One of the things I'm learning with Daniel Smith uh, Water Mixables, as I do with all, is what medium to use or not and to use water or not, and how much. Um, like I was telling you earlier, the flow is much better, it seems like, on a smaller painting because you're not going that far, but the bigger painting is where I need to find the correct amount of medium or water, depending on what I want to use at the time, to make it so the paint flows a little easier than it did for me on the uh, grass, uh, grass, on the um, water and the sky. So I know I need more, but how much more? When I'm doing a medium, especially during the middle of a painting, I'm very cautious. I'd rather have 
I'd rather use a lot less, well, not a lot less, but I'd rather use less than more. You know, less you can um, pretty much adjust easier. If you use too much, you know, it's going to mess up your painting, especially if you're using water. If I use too much water, it's just going to, the paint's not going to adhere to the surface and it's, you know, it's going to be a wasted trip. So I always err on the side of less for um, my medium when I'm trying to experiment. And in art in general, you know, there's an old adage, less is more. And I found out in my life as an artist that is very correct. You know, when you think you got a little bit more to do on a painting, stop. Just let it sit for a while, go back to it, let's say a week later, and then reassess it. Because sometimes while we're painting it, we have all these other ideas and we think this, that, and the other thing. Sometimes we need to just leave it alone. And then once we leave it alone, we'll come back to it and then we'll get a better, we'll have a better frame of mind. Now, this is something I've never done before, or if I have, I don't remember doing water this way. Now, I've used a palette knife with water before. Okay, so that part isn't. It's the way of using it. I'm doing the left to right reasonably, well, they're horizontal for sure, but reasonably straight. I'm veering off a little bit. But what I'm going to do is it's not going to stay like that. I'm going to use a two-inch bristle brush, and then I'm going to kind of diffuse the paint to make it all come together a little bit better. And I'm going to have to do this a couple times because I've never done it before. So it didn't turn out exactly what I wanted the first time, and then you just keep working at it. And one of the things I've been wanting to do with the videos, and I have done with all of them, is if there's something I'm trying new or if there's something I mess up on, I don't edit that out. Um, I think it's a disservice to anybody watching my videos if I edit out the mistakes because everybody makes mistakes. You know, Leonardo da Vinci made mistakes on every painting. Nobody has ever executed a painting from start to finish flawlessly. I don't believe that's ever happened. And I don't think anybody would ever tell you they've done it. So what I like to do is show the good and the bad. And what's good about the bad is it also shows you how to fix the bad. Oil paint is very forgiving and allows you the time to do it. And you see, I did it that second time, and now I've got that water movement that I really wanted. And it just worked out so much better. The first one wasn't. Now I've got it where I want Okay, now this is the part. It's going to look really ugly, and I'm going to think about it for like three seconds, and then I'm going to get rid of it. And um, not this part. It's on the bottom right of the painting. That's the part that's coming up here real soon. And I like doing these dark reeds and then putting the flowers on them and stuff. For whatever reason, this one, I couldn't execute it that well like I have in other paintings, and it just looked really bad. And I actually took the painting knife and scraped it off, and then I started over. And then what I started over with looked so much better, and that's what I kept. But look at that. You know, I'm doing it right now thinking to myself, damn, that looks bad. And, you know, sometimes you got to finish it to know for sure that it's wrong but uh, I didn't have to think about it too long I'm putting on a little bit of white to try to save it knowing in my head there's no saving it I just got to rip it off and start over and that's what I'm going to do and like I said that's one of the beautiful things about oil painting oil painting can be more complicated than other mediums however the water mixable takes away a lot of the complications because usually the complications were from solvents and um, brush cleaners and things like that. Now, with the water mixables, it's very similar to acrylics of how you execute a painting, but you have the oil painting open time to be able to do what I'm about to do here, and that is take a palette knife, get rid of that garbage, and put something on that actually does look good. And right now, you just saw me step behind the camera, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, not good. And it, there it goes. Goodbye, ugly. 
And trust me, I'm looking at it now in the video, and it didn't look as bad as it did in person. In person, I don't want to say hideous, but it was darn close. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going to use a little bit of darker with purple and alizarin, and I'm just going to make a bunch of bushes that looks so much better. And I'm going to do the dark and the light, and get a nice little contrast with the um, with the color and the values. And then it's going to be, oh, this will be nice. But I really love painting. And one of the things about water mixable oils that I am not ashamed or afraid to tell anybody. Like at my last show, I was at uh, Naper Settlement in Naperville, Illinois. And I had several people come up to me, actually more than that, and ask, you know, what kind of paint I use and everything else. And I'll sit there for hours and talk about, you know, using oil paint and then especially since I used to use conventional oils for so many years and now that I have the um, Daniel Smith that I finally found that I liked I tried and I've told you this before I think several other water mixable oils and I didn't like them at all so the Daniel Smith is what I settled on and so far I'm still learning it but so far I really like it so there is my video for this week I hope everybody enjoyed it if you did, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you do, hit that uh, little notification bell so whenever I upload something else, you uh, know what's going on. And uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of your work week, and I'll see you next time.